Great. So hi, everyone. My name is Kit Fairgreave, and I'm a family physician. Um, I did a fellowship last year at St. Paul's Hospital in addiction medicine and currently working on staff at St. Paul's Hospital. Um, I also just want to acknowledge Amanda Geisler, who just set up the um, uh, my presentation here, who is coordinating the provincial efforts for developing uh, education for um, from the BC Center on Substance Use. So we all appreciate her um, her hard work. Okay, so I'm going to go through uh, after that introduction from Dr. Hamid about the, um, the the general aspects of opioid use disorder and treatment options and the new guidelines of the BCCSU. I'm going to present a, a variation on um, a presentation that I gave at Family Medicine Forum last year, and this is on office-based induction of buprenorphine and naloxone. Um, after having done this talk a number of times around the province over the last few months, I'll preface this by saying that I. Um, probably one of the most common comments that we get from family physicians is that starting someone on buprenorphine um, in in your practice can be very challenging. It's time intensive, labor intensive. And so I just want to acknowledge that right off the bat, that it's something that, um, that may not be really feasible or practical to be doing regularly in your practice. And the goal of this talk isn't necessarily to say that you have to be doing that. Uh, what I'd like to do is to present this just so that you're aware of the logistics, the pharmacology of buprenorphine, um, how it could be done. So hopefully it will demystify it, dispel any myths or um, uh, fears that you may have about doing it just to make you feel confident that you could start it. Um, but having said that, that often um, uh, local specialty expertise may be needed in order to help start someone on buprenorphine effectively. But then once they're started, they could be transferred back to your practice for ongoing um, maintenance, which could which could be fairly straightforward in general. So hopefully that's helpful for you to know just as a, um, a caveat at, uh, right at the, the outset of this this talk. Okay, so can I minimize this by any chance? This thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Thanks. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure the slides were, uh, I was seeing the same thing you were. So uh, just some information on the pharmacology of bupor buprenorphine and naloxone, um, otherwise known brand name Suboxone, um, uh, which is really essential in understanding how it's administered. Oops. Okay. So you can see here that uh, buprenorphine is uh, like other opioids, in this case it's semi-synthetic, that uh, opioids are in general go back to the poppy plant. So here's the poppy plant, um, slices are made in it and the, 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 um, the liquid inside dries and turns in this resin that's turned into opium. And there are a number of alkaloids that are present in buprenorphine, um, or sorry, in, in opium um, that are are called natural opiates, and that includes morphine, codeine, which are the most common, as well as a, a lesser known one called thebane. So you can see here that thebane is converted um, into, in a semi-synthetic process, into um, buprenorphine, which is a long-acting opioid. So some history that I like to um, uh, I'm, I'm always interested in, in terms of buprenorphine, just to highlight that it was developed in the 1960s as an analgesic. So uh, keep in mind that a lot of people have um, doubts about its value as a pain medication, but it's an opioid and actually was developed for the um, uh, strict intention of uh, analgesic property. And first was used in that way in uh, the UK in 1979. And then in France in 1995, as uh, Keith Ahmed mentioned, that there was um, a real uptake and adoption of the use of, of buprenorphine for the treatment of opioid use disorder. And they saw, again, a significant decrease in the number of overdoses. It was subsequently approved in the US in 2002 and Canada much later in 2008. So it's now been available for almost a decade, but you can see that relative to other countries around the world that um, um, that we've been later to approve it. And BC is one of the last provinces to approve it for um, use by all physicians. So I think it makes sense that, that we're not as familiar with it. It's available in two, um, in two formulations. One is buprenorphine only, and that's called Subutex. And then the more common version, which is buprenorphine in combination with naloxone, and that's called Suboxone, as I mentioned, you're more, more likely aware of. Um, there's also a transdermal patch version of buprenorphine that's called Butrans, and that's been approved in Canada in 2010 for the treatment of pain. Just to be aware that Suboxone or Subutex, that those aren't 
um, technically approved for the use of um, for pain. So any anytime you're using Suboxone or um, or Subutex for pain, that that's would be considered technically off label use. All right. So in terms of the pharmaco pharmacotherapy, uh, there are two components as we've mentioned. The first is buprenorphine, and as I'll explain in more detail, this is a partial mu agonist, meaning it binds to the mu opioid receptor, um, but it doesn't bind as um, tightly as a full opioid agonist like something like methadone or also heroin, hydromorphone, most other opioids. It's also an antagonist at the opioid kappa receptor, which I'll, I'll describe in a minute. So in addition, it has a high binding affinity for the receptors, but a lower intrinsic activity compared to other opioids. And hopefully that, uh, that makes sense. Any questions about that? No, okay, good. Um, if there are, happy to review in more detail afterwards. As I mentioned, uh, naloxone is a second component that's been added into the, the um, suboxone formulation. And that, as you're likely aware, is an opioid antagonist, Narcan, that we, uh, we routinely give in reversing overdoses. It comes in a four to one ratio. So that would look like either eight slash two milligrams or two slash 0.5 milligram tablets. You can see here, and I think this is really important in understanding how it is that um, that buprenorphine naloxone works. So um, bioavailability, which is how much of a, um, of a medication actually becomes active in um, in the body, if it's taken orally, so if you simply swallow a tablet, that keep in mind that the buprenorphine is almost inactive with only about 3% bioavailability, and the naloxone is essentially inactive, so it's inert. If it's taking sublingually, which is the uh, recommended route of administration, the buprenorphine is then active at about 55% bioavailability, and uh, the naloxone has some activity, but still very minimal. And that's why people, when they take it sublingually, they're not Narcanning themselves, because there's essentially no naloxone component. However, if they try to uh, inject it in a parenteral route, so uh, IV or intramuscular, subcutaneous, that uh, the buprenorphine, not only is the buprenorphine not very active at less than 5%, but the naloxone um, becomes active and 70% uh, bioavailability, and that's the time when someone is essentially Narcanning themselves. So earlier I'd mentioned the different types of opioid receptors. You're likely familiar with, I'll just go back with the uh, mu opioid receptor, which is the second column there. And that's the, the most common opioid receptor. And, and uh, for most opioids, that they, they bind most tightly to this receptor. And that most of the effects of opioids in terms of the euphoria, the sedation, the analgesic effect, that those are mostly um, um, a result of the mu opioid receptor. However, you can see here that the last col column on the right, the kappa opioid receptor is lesser known, but there are a number of properties that um, are really important with respect to buprenorphine. So buprenorphine, uh, as I mentioned, is a kappa antagonist. And so what it does is it blocks some of the effects of the kappa receptor, including the dysphoria and sedation that you can get um, with the kappa receptor. So by blocking those, you have less dysphoria or a euphoric effect and less sedation. So both of those are part of the reason why uh, buprenorphine is so much safer than methadone or other full opioid agonists. In addition, as I mentioned, buprenorphine also has a high binding affinity. And that means essentially that um, how tightly it's binding to the receptor relative to other opioids. So you can see here that buprenorphine, on average, is among the highest in terms of the binding affinity. You can see above buprenorphine that sufentanyl, um, or fentanyl, which is halfway down the list, but has, if you look on the actual uh, graph, has potentially even an even higher binding affinity, um, that those could potentially have... Um, uh, still bind to the receptor even when buprenorphine is present. However, for most of the other opioids there, um, for example, morphine or oxycodone or codeine, typical opioids that we might prescribe to people or that they might use illicitly, that those have a much lower bi binding affinity. And for that reason, um, as you'll see, buprenorphine, if, if it's given when any of those are present, will push them off the receptor. I'd also like to highlight that, as you can see there, hydromorphone, I'll just highlight that, right below buprenorphine also has a significantly uh, high binding affinity. So if you ever cause precipitated withdrawal that I'll talk about, that hydromorphone could be uh, a potential reversing agent or something to reduce those symptoms.
Okay, here's just a quick little cartoon to help illustrate hopefully a little bit better as well. So you can see here uh, in the image on the left that you've got this empty receptor um, and the green molecule there is a full opioid agonist such as methadone. And then in the image on the right that you can see it, it binding perfectly and causing a full agonist effect that includes um, um, euphoria, pain, um, sorry, euphoria and treatment of pain and withdrawal symptoms. Okay, here these little yellow dots are buprenorphine and you can see that it's not binding as well to the opioid receptor and as a result you get less intrinsic activity. Um, and at the same time, because it has a higher binding affinity, when any of those green molecules try are, are also present, that um, they can't bind to the receptor. Furthermore, as you can see here on the right, that it dissipates slowly because it's long acting so that it can provide an ongoing effect. The reverse, so if you have here on the right, if you have a green full agonist bound to the receptor and then you introduce the yellow buprenorphine, will push that off the receptor and that causes precipitated withdrawal. And that means essentially you're causing an, a sudden um, decrease in the amount of um, opioid effect and, and that's um, uh, felt as a withdrawal. Okay, so having understood hopefully that pharmaco pharmacotherapy, or sorry, the pharmacology a bit better, um, we'll talk about how that is implicated in how you can successfully start someone in your office on buprenorphine naloxone. So I just want to highlight a few papers that have been done. This is in the New England Jour Journal of Medicine about 10 years ago or so. And they started people in an office-based setting and they found um, that it, in general, it reduced opioid cravings. It improved both subjective and clinician impression of overall status. So significant changes by that, but you know, a bit qualitative in terms of how they're uh, um, describing that. And then they had a follow-up study where they looked at... Um, uh, they compared buprenorphine naloxone plus or minus counseling. And what, what they found in this graph here, it's called the Kaplan-Meier curve, was they found that the counseling essentially didn't add any added value, at least within that first six month, six month period. So it's a medication uh, with or without counseling that seems to really be providing the effect. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, office-based induction is generally safe and straightforward in an office-based setting, but the main goal and the main barrier with starting somebody on buprenorphine naloxone is the risk of precipitated withdrawal. So avoiding that is, uh, is the, the key skill and something that hopefully you'll all feel confident in doing by the end of this talk. All right, so again, just to reinforce what we've been going through already, that precipitated withdrawal happens for this reason. Buprenorphine has a high affinity for the opioid receptor and will bump off other opioids off the receptor. Because it has a lower intrinsic activity, the person um, receiving buprenorphine loxone would then go into a precipitated withdrawal state because the receptors are only then being partially stimulated, and this causes opioid withdrawal symptoms. Uh, just to review, which you're likely all uh, familiar with, is that opioid withdrawal is experienced like a flu-like state. So you have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, cramps. Um, you also get things like um, piloerection. You can get sweating, chills, um, as well as decreased mood, agitation, cravings. So it's just a very uncomfortable state. The time after last use um, uh, at which someone starts developing withdrawal and the extent to which they develop is um, it, it varies and it's it's affected by the dose they're taking, how frequently they're taking it, the route of administration, uh, but also their individual tolerance for stress or withdrawal and that can vary quite a bit. Some people can tolerate it quite easily, even heavy users, whereas other times people, even if they're not even using um, large doses, may have very low tolerance to any kind of withdrawal or cravings. You can see too that whether the formulation of the opioid is also um, important, as you can appreciate, so that short-acting opioids would, would tend to develop um, withdrawal symptoms sooner, and longer-acting opioids such as methadone could take a longer time in order to develop um, withdrawal symptoms. So as I, uh, going back to this previous slide and adding on, um, that again, I just want to really emphasize that this is a safe and straightforward process most of the time, provided that someone is in a um, is in enough of a state of withdrawal. So that requires two things. The first one is a minim, minimum time period since their last opioid use. So for short-acting opioids, it's recommended that they um, that someone have at least 12 hours, but ideally up to 24 hours in order to um, 
uh, to start buprenorphine naloxone safely without precipitating withdrawal. And for longer acting opioids, and uh, specifically methadone, you may have to wait at least 48 hours and even up to, to 72 to 96 hours or longer for some people. And that the transition from methadone to buprenorphine naloxone uh, tends to have the greatest risk of precipitated withdrawal because it's so long acting. So in addition to waiting long enough, the person also has to be in a, in a severe enough state of withdrawal. Um, and the way that you gauge this is a scale called the COWS or the Clinical Opioid Withdrawal Scale that's analogous to the CWA scale that you may be familiar with. And it's essentially just a, an objective scale that incorporates all those opioid withdrawal symptoms that we reviewed before. So once they're in a moderate to severe um, degree of withdrawal, uh, which is determined by a cow score of at least 13, that you can then attempt to, uh, to it's, it's reasonable to attempt to give someone um, buprenorphine naloxone without hopefully precipitating withdrawal. However, it's it's not always predictable. So what I would recommend is once someone's met those two, their, those first two criteria, that you then give them an, an, a low initial dose. So two milligrams, so the smaller tablet, or if you're really concerned, you can even split it in half and give them a single milligram of buprenorphine. Um, and that minimizes the extent to which if you do precipitate withdrawal, which hopefully you won't do, but if that does happen, that after a milligram, it's likely going to be very mild, if anything. This is uh, just a, a quick, um, just visual, just a look at what the cow scale looks like. We're not going to go through it, uh, nor could you likely read it. But it's easy. If you're interested, I would just Google um, suboxone cows or, um, you know, buprenorphine cows, and and you'll, you can just easily find this and print it off if you ever need to do it. All right, so if precipitate withdrawal occurs, and um, I have to say I've I've induced people on buprenorphine and naloxone hundreds of times, and the, the vast major, majority of the time it's um, safe and straightforward, as I as I've uh, as I've said. If it does happen, and it does from time to time, and, and often when I'm being too aggressive in retrospect, uh, trying to give it too soon or not waiting until someone's in enough withdrawal, that uh, it is manageable. So um, you can provide empathy, just you know let someone know that you know that they're you appreciate what they're going through is uncomfortable for them but provide some reassurance opioid withdrawal is not life threatening they're not going to have an anaphylactic reaction or you know pass out or lose con or um you know stop breathing or anything like that and you can treat their withdrawal symptoms the same way you would for any kind of opioid withdrawal often with uh, adjuvant medications that are uh, that are not opioids so things like clonidine can be really helpful for chills or, or sweating uh, gravol imodium for nausea vomiting diarrhea uh, fluids can be really helpful Tylenol, ibuprofen, if they're having aches and pains. So it is possible to manage those symptoms, and clonidine can actually be surprisingly effective for lots of people. Um, if it happened and you're uncertain on how to proceed, you know whether to give more buprenorphine naloxone, whether to hold off, whether to just try to overwhelm them with hydromorphone, all of which may be reasonable options, um, and really is based on uh, the individual experience and and how long it's been and and you know how severe their withdrawal is, then um, hopefully you'll, you will have some local resources that you could hopefully make, make use of. And some of the presentations we've done around the province, uh, there have been local buprenorphine naloxone or methadone providers or, uh, other physicians who may have expertise in treating substance use disorders, or if there's a detox in your community or some other option that those are all things that you could potentially refer to. Otherwise there are some provincial resources, so if you're in Vancouver, we have some resources that uh, include the Rapid Access Addiction Clinic at St. Paul's Hospital, where I work. Um, there is a START program for home-based buprenorphine naloxone inductions in Vancouver. Or provincially, there are things like the RACE line. So if you Google RACE line or there's an app um, that you can contact someone from our service uh, and we can provide support. But hopefully, there will be someone in your community, uh, if possible, who may be um, may have an interest in this or may be able to guide you as well. Oh, yes, there's a question. Okay, so in the question channel, we have someone asking, um, since you say the person must already be in moderate to severe withdrawal to start the induction, what do you mean happens to them with precipitated withdrawal? Uh, and to follow that, it was just a worsening of the symptoms they already have. And how quickly do the precipitated s symptoms become clear? That's a really good question. So uh, where is it again? I just want to see. Oh, great. I'm just going to start with the first one. So um, so they, they must be in enough withdrawal 
what happens with precipitate withdrawal. So that's a really good question that we have to separate what that means, precipitate withdrawal versus just regular withdrawal. And so the regular withdrawal that they're, they're experiencing tends to happen slowly and, and uh, gradually over a number of hours. So often, you know, they'll start having cravings and then maybe they get a bit sweaty or, or they get a headache. And then over time they're, they're starting to get chills or they're, they're getting nauseous. Um, and it can get more severe and, you know, this worsening kind of flu like state. Um, and that tends to be fairly gradual. But if you, if you were to truly precipitate withdrawal, uh, the way it, it, that most people would experience it would be that all of a sudden over the, the span of say 10 or 20 minutes, that their withdrawal would worsen significantly more. And that's where the term precipitated comes because it just drops suddenly, uh, from, from one state to a much higher state. Um, so yes, it's a worsening of the symptom, but it's significantly more than if they were to just continue without any opioid. And then how quickly do, um, do the symptoms become clear? So again, I guess as, as I've said already, that tends to be fairly quick, but not always. Sometimes what happens is um, it could be more um, insidious. So it's happened where I've given someone two milligrams after, let's say, 16 hours and then waited an hour or two hours after that to see. And they say, you know, maybe they feel the same or they feel a little better, um, but but no worse. And then I've given a larger dose and then all of a sudden they have worsening withdrawal. So it's possible that it can take longer. Um, and, you know, to be honest, even though we do this all day long, that that um, sometimes it's just unpredictable, unfortunately. Um, but so as I, I said in this, or as I'm uh, trying to indicate in this slide, though, when it does happen, that it's manageable and, and that the goal would be, you know, if it was really severe, you could overwhelm with hydromorphone if, if the person was really uncomfortable. Um, and then because the buprenorphine is also in their system and it's longer acting, you could then potentially uh, continue with, with subsequent doses of buprenorphine naloxone after. But, you know, this is really the expertise where I would, uh, I would reach out to the race line or a local colleague to get some guidance about how to do that. Okay, so it's sort of beyond the scope of this talk really to, to have to tease out what to do. And I really don't want you to come away from this, this talk thinking like, oh, this is going to happen and that, and how do I manage it? I'm just putting the slide in to say that if it does happen, it's, it's not the end of the world. It is manageable. Um, but that by and large, if you're following the, the guidelines, as I've set, set out there, waiting long enough, waiting till they're in enough withdrawal, giving them a test dose and waiting an hour or two before you give any subsequent doses, by and large, it's going to be very successful. And most people will tell you, yeah, I feel a little better. And then you give them a subsequent dose of maybe two or four milligrams. And an hour after that, and they say, yeah, I'm feeling better. You know, by the next day, they often feel, they'll tell you they feel actually pretty good. And I have to say the, the adjective that gets used most often by people in my experience on buprenorphine naloxone is that they feel normal. They just feel like themselves again. And it really is an excellent medication for a lot of people. Okay, so looks like those answered your questions. So I appreciate that. And um, really good questions to ask. Okay, so... Um, you know, let's say that did happen, just to be aware that you could treat those and then have them come back the next day and give them a subsequent dose of buprenorphine naloxone and um, that that generally would be safe. If even, again, even if they've used other opioids in the meantime, you'd still want to assess and, and be uh, judicious, but potentially you could start it. If they haven't used anything in the subsequent 12 or 24 hours since you saw them the day before, then most likely that uh, it would be very safe for you to give them buprenorphine naloxone without any fears. I, it's, it's very rare that after 24 hours that someone would experience a precipitated withdrawal unless they're using a longer acting um, opioid like methadone. Okay, great. So, um, so let's say you've given them the initial dose and I've sort of gotten ahead of myself, but you want to reassess an hour or two afterwards and ensure that they haven't had worsening withdrawal symptoms. Uh, if anything, as I said, they're, they're going to feel a little better or maybe no change just from one hour to the next. Um, if they do feel worse, but it's been gradual or it's mild, you know, you, you could reassess, but, but you may want to actually persist with more doses because that may just be regular withdrawal. Um, then let's say it's the end of the day or, you know, um, that you know you're not likely to see them again. You could consider take-home doses, so a few doses of two or four milligrams to take sublingually every four hours uh, overnight, and you can provide them with some education, as I'll describe later, on how to take that properly. The maximum dose recommended in BC is 12 milligrams on day one, and that's just to make sure that they're not getting too drowsy. But higher doses have been given uh, routinely, often given by you know our group, and generally safe and well tolerated. 
uh, an overdose or you know any kind of sedation even would be really rare. So home induction. So again, that it may be impractical. Uh, let's say someone comes in and they've just they've told you they just used at six o'clock in the morning and it's now ten o'clock in the morning in your office and you're not really going to be able to follow them you know, serially uh, over the course of the day until 6 or 8 p.m. And it's unlikely that you're going to be able to start it over the day. Rather than just trying to, you know, keep them around or whatever, you may consider having them either, if they can abstain that evening and come back the next day, you could try that. And you give them something like clonidine to help them through it. Um, but also you, you can consider giving them uh, a take-home dose. So, uh, you know, again, it would be the, an appropriate candidate who you feel like is uh, would be able to take it appropriately and wait long enough uh, and wouldn't divert it or abuse it, um, that uh, it could be effective. And or other things, let's say they can't get there with, within, uh, you know, working hours or something like that, then you can consider that as well. So you can give them a, a either the cows or you could give them a patient version in plain language that's called the Subjective Opioid Withdrawal Scale or SOWS. Uh, and education is really important. Ideally, they could call a provider. So for some people, communities have told me that they could call a, a detox at night that would have a nurse or someone who could give them guidance on whether to take it and how long. Um, and uh, keep in mind that even if you're doing a home start, that you can still go back to, to daily dispense or daily witnessed ingestion following the induction. All right, so in terms of patient education, you want to let them know that because they, if they swallow it, it will do nothing, that the tablet is sublingual and that they can put it under their tongue and uh, that it can take up to 10 minutes to dissolve, especially if there are high doses. So... Uh, to help that, you want to tell them not to swallow or drink water. Uh, one of my colleagues, Annabelle Mead, likes to tell people to put their nose up a bit in like a sniffing position, and that way the excess saliva will just drain slowly but without swallowing the whole thing. Um, it's recommended in the product monograph that you try to avoid uh, smoking or drink coffee an hour before because it can affect the mucosal absorption. And after the 10 minutes, if there's any leftover saliva or um, tablet residue, that they can swallow that safely or spit it out. Uh, and then keep in mind to let the patient know that the naloxone component is inactive and it only becomes active when it's snorted or injected, which will cause withdrawal. So if you deter them right off the bat, hopefully they, they're not going to try that. Okay, so that's day one. You have them come back the next day and ask them how much they've taken, how they're doing. And the, daily, the dose that they used uh, over that day becomes the daily dose uh, on day two. Doses can be subsequently increased in two to four milligram increments each day as needed for ongoing treatment of withdrawal cra uh, symptoms or cravings. Keep in mind, however, that it's long acting, so it, it may take a few days to reach a steady state, and you don't necessarily have to be increasing every day. Um, you can you can reassure the patient that on day two or day three, they might have more of an effect at that same dose than they do on the first day. Uh, but you could increase it uh, fairly aggressively if needed. If someone's really uncomfortable, then you can in increase it. And um, to a max of even 24 milligrams per day is the, the, the max recommended by Health Canada. You can get up to that even on day two. Um, uh, I might still be a, a little cautious, but just so you know that by and large, that's going to be well tolerated if needed. Uh, or they'll, there'll be patients who will tell you, yeah, I used to be on it. I was on 24. I was on even 32 milligrams and, you know, 12 milligrams or 60 milligrams isn't really going to touch it. I need higher doses. I'd probably go up maybe 20 on day, day two, have them come back the next day or the day after and put them up to 24. If side effects occur, uh, as I'll go through, the dose should be maintained or lowered until the side effects resolve. And like any other medication, you want to reach a balance between the, you know, the benefits and uh, minimizing or avoiding any side effects. So some challenges with the, the induction, as I mentioned at the, the outset, again, that this can be time consuming, could require several assessments over the course of the day. Um, so if you have any local resources, consider referring to them for induction. And I know based on some of our provincial talks that some local providers will say, yeah, if you can bring them to the eMERGE, bring them into the detox, even bring them into hospital, or if they're already in hospital for another indication that that may be the time to do an, uh, an induction when you have that support. As I mentioned in Vancouver, there are a couple of local options um, for anyone listening who's in the Vancouver area, including the Rapid Access Addiction Clinic and the START program run through Vancouver Coastal Health, as I mentioned. Um, again, once you've induced them successfully, you've really gotten over the main hurdle with buprenorphine naloxone. And as Keith had described earlier, that after that, it's really all benefits and uh, very few downsides to it. Okay, so continuing someone who's been started on it as a, as a primary care provider is uh, generally quite straightforward.
All right, so there are some uh, resources in terms of uh, the rack, or this is the start program. And there's the phone number if you wanted to access that, or just Google it. All right, I wanted to uh, move on and do some practical. Oh, it seems to be updating. Oh, great. Okay, thanks. So um, I wanted to uh, go over some practical aspects in terms of billing and urine drug screening and things like that. And these slides were developed by Christy Sutherland, who works with Amanda and is um, the, the new head of the um, uh, methadone and buprenorphine um, naloxone program with the BC Center on Substance Use and has worked really hard. Both of them have worked really hard to develop a lot of content that is going to be live in July. So I just want to acknowledge Christy and all the work that she and Amanda have done and uh, go through some of the slides that she's presented. So just to review, she doesn't have any financial disclosures, nor do I. Um, and um, so, so let's say someone has been induced elsewhere and they come into your practice and you can go, go over it. How did it go? Who, where'd you have it done? You know, any, um, any, uh, precipitated withdrawal, negative effects, positive experience, you know, whatever. Uh, and then you want to check them with other things, you know, how are they doing as far as housing, their psychosocial supports and their goals of therapy and see, you know, assess various domains, including, you know, whether their goal is abstinence versus, uh, reduction, whether, um, you know, they have unlikely by the time they've seen you, but it's possible. They may say, yeah, you know, I've been out for two weeks since I left the detox. And, uh, you know, I really find I'm not having to engage in criminal activity or sex work or, you know, um, I haven't been using as much or at all, you know, so you want to just see how things are going for them. Are they taking their medications? Um, and then you want to check in and see how things are going for them. Is their dose enough for them? Are they having any side effects and do you need to reduce it? Or are they having any things like withdrawal, uh, cravings or any ongoing opioid use, any other substance use, and that may that may um, lead you to change the dose at all. There's a question here: uh, if the daily dose is best taken all at once or divided. So I'll just take a quick a quick uh, aside to answer that question. So um, good question. Generally speaking, it's given all at once, and again, especially if you're starting someone right away, that it's recommended that they go to the pharmacy daily. Uh, I would like to say that it's daily witness ingestion, but often the pharmacies are not witnessing. So in practice, it's essentially daily dispense. Um, and you can split it, especially if you want to improve someone's pain, or some people will tell you that it wears off and that when they split it, so instead of, let's say, 24 milligrams a day, you know, if you're giving them carries and they can take eight milligrams three times a day, they may have better pain or um, withdrawal management symptoms. But most of the time we're starting at once a day. And because it's long acting, really, for most people, uh, unless they, they have some um, rapid metabolizing or a chronic, you know, pain condition or something, that most people are going to be able to take it once daily. Uh, the other thing that Christy wanted to highlight was psychosocial functioning. So, um, uh, you know, whether their mood's good, whether they're able to do their acti activities of daily living, all those things. Okay, another question, and maybe um, with all due respect, I'll just take one more question and then I'll get through the rest of the presentation and then I'll take questions at the end. Okay, so gabapentin used to manage withdrawal symptoms. Um, uh, good question. Gabapentin doesn't really have any good evidence based for, for treating um a opioid withdrawal. Uh, there is some evidence for treating alcohol withdrawal. Uh, potentially, you know, it, it could have some some effect on calming someone, but uh, in general, we don't tend to use in our group routinely for opioid withdrawal. Um, we tend to use something more like clonidine. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I get back to the slide that, okay, so you've got a patient on Suboxone, as Keith mentioned, that the goal is to get them up to a dose of at least 16 milligrams. Um, so again, you're going up by two to four milligrams per day, you know, while you're following them along. And you might want to see them weekly until they're reaching a stable dose and doing well. And then you could see them anywhere up to, you know, every two to four weeks eventually. Remember to check Pharmanet each visit and document that you're doing that to make sure that they're taking their medication regularly, that they're not getting any other scripts for other opioids or uh, anything like benzos that may make their suboxone prescribing more dangerous. And then um, it's a good good chance when you're seeing them to follow up and see if they've had testing like liver enzymes, whether they've, they've had STI testing like um, or uh, not necessarily STI, but infectious disease testing like HIV, Hep C, syphilis, community gonorrhea, and a pregnancy test. And for stable patients, you may want to start them on caries um, eventually, and this can be dispensed in a blister pack like other medications, and that way you can call in. You could also give in a, in a bottle, but either way, you could potentially call back in or have them come back into pharmacy for or clinic for random pill counts. Uh, and then 
remember that having caries can improve treatment retention and adherence because one of the goals uh, or one of the things that people don't like about methadone is that they have to go to the pharmacy every day and they they feel it's stigmatizing and can be really um, inconvenient. If I had to go to the pharmacy every day, it would be very difficult for me to to get there and to stay on a medication. Um, and so the ability to potentially start carry sooner or to be more liberal about how they're how they're being done um, can hopefully be a nice buy-in for people wanting to try and, and get on buprenorphine naloxone. Um, and also, you know, having carries is a nice way of um, recognizing that someone is doing well. However, however, in order to do that, they have to have housing. So if someone has unstable housing, they're homeless, living in a tent where the medication storage may not be safe, then that that uh, it would not be recommended. If uh, they have to have appropriate urine drug screening, meaning that their urine drug screens are positive for the things that they're being prescribed and they're negative for other uh, substances of abuse that are being measured. So if they're using other substances, that that may be a barrier for you providing them with carries. Uh, it's important to make a, track a record of clinic and appointment attendance. So if they're missing appointments, coming late, that those are all signs of accountability and stability. And if they have any severe behavioral or mental health issues, that those may be a barrier to providing carries as well. But it's it's a balance. Uh, this is the this is from last year for the uh, CPSBC methadone and buprenorphine uh, prescribing guidelines. And just want to highlight that with carry privileges, that with methadone, that obviously, uh, or as you may be aware, that because methadone is potentially so dangerous, both for people who are being prescribed it taking too much or you know too often, uh, more than is being prescribed, or for other people, family members, friends who consume it by accident, it can be potentially fatal. So providing carries is very regimented on how that can be done. And the college recognizes that with buprenorphine naloxone that it's it's um, significantly safer um, and so that providing carries can be more flexible and liberal and really at the prescriber's discretion. Right. Okay, so here are some sample scripts that Christy has written here to uh, Jane Austen as the patient uh, who lives on in the Portland Hotel, apparently. Um, and uh, so, I don't know, it just if you're interested in how a script gets written, um, I can't point to it, but that you can see there, you want to write all the patient identifiers, their PHN, their date of birth, today, you know, the, the prescribing date, the name, their address, especially if it's being delivered, you, you want that to be there. And then the, the Suboxone and the dose, and then you indicate the uh, the dates that it's being prescribed in this case daily witness ingestion or DWI or or daily dispense and then the full dose and you sign off and you write your contact information and here's another one where someone is is getting carries and so here it's written daily um, and in a blister pack and it's it's being witnessed weekly on Wednesdays during that same period of time and the rest would be carries in a blister pack. All right, so now some um, information on urine drug screening, which is an important part of accountability and follow-up for any patient who are on uh, not just buprenorphine naloxone, but methadone or any other opioids or other substances that uh, should be a routine part of care. So point of care urine drug screening can be done in office. And uh, as you'll see in a few minutes, that there is uh, a billing code for it to ho hopefully compensate the, co the cost to your office of providing that. And it's an important tool that um, can actually change um, um, in office decisions immediately. So for example, if someone has caries and their, their urine drug screen is positive for cocaine, you may have to revoke or, or reduce those caries. Um, then, um, uh, and the, the urine drug screen tests, um, that are, um, the drugs that they test for varies by the actual immunoassay or the test, and that varies by manufacturer. The kind of basic one, the f top five would be morphine, methadone, benzos, cocaine, and amphetamines, but there are more sophisticated ones that also include things like fentanyl and buprenorphine. So if you're able to get those, that that would be ideal. Um, then if there's any unexpected results, so let's say you get a, you get an, an unexpected negative result, so you're prescribing them an Ativan, or, you know, Ativan and it's negative for benzos, or you're prescribing them buprenorphine, naloxone, and it's negative for um, buprenorphine, that you can then send it to the lab for specific testing. Um, a confirmation testing. You can also uh, s test for specific drugs that your, your uh, in-office tool may not have. Uh, and then it can even tell you about things like the specific benzodiazepine and metabolites if you need to decide, is this person taking the benzos that I'm prescribing or are they taking um, some illicit benzos? So um, when you do send something to lab, uh, ask for confirmation of buprenorphine and fentanyl. 
if uh, you don't have that already, or even if you do and you're unsure, just to add that in. Uh, so how often to do this? You don't need to do this every time you see them. Um, as you'll see that you can build this up to 26 times a year, but in general, it should be done at least monthly um, once they're being stabilized and after that. Um, so if they have consistent, they're at a therapeutic dose, they're taking it regularly, they have housing, and they've got serial negative urine drug screens, and they are starting to get caries, they can then do it about eight times a year, ideally in a randomized way. And how do you do that? Well, you could call them back in the clinic and have them do it there, or you could give them a lab rec and say, we're going to call you on a random day, and then you then, you then have 24 hours to go to the lab and provide a sample there. Uh, charting, so in your, your notes, make sure that you um, chart whether it's a random or a non-random or just regular office visit. So they're coming for their script and they provide a urine, you know, that's scheduled. So they're expecting to go and that changes kind of what you might expect to see in the results uh, than if you did it randomly. And then make sure to check the urine drug screen history and mark on it, or mark on it in your progress note. Uh, keep in mind that there are, that false positives and false negatives are frequent, and especially in some of the, the office-based um, tests, so they can be cheap, and, and uh, unfortunately, some of them are uh, can be less accurate than others. So, for example, amphetamines has common false positives, and this could be things like trazodone, stimulants, energy drinks, or other supplements that could be falsely positive for an actual amphetamine that, that they're not taking. Uh, and then common false negatives. So benzodiazepines such as lorazepam or clonazepam could potentially be negative falsely despite the fact that they're taking them regularly. All right, so some uh, notes on billing. There is a billing code that you can do for subox patients on buprenorphine naloxone, uh, 00039. You can also, it's now expanded as of a month ago, so that you can also use that code for any other kind of opioid agonist therapy, including methadone, but also if you had patients on cadian or injectable opioids, that you can use this as well and uh, use that code. Just to keep in mind that if you're using this code, the 304 for office visits, um, Sorry, you can't bill the 304 if you're billing the 00039. So Dr. Sutherland recommends that you discuss something else other than the buprenorphine naloxone in order to use that code. But uh, as was pointed out at a, a talk we did last night, that um, the idea of this code is that you, you provided a weekly fee um, to, to be available and provide ongoing care for someone on buprenorphine naloxone. But you can also bill other codes when you see them for other things as well. Okay, so um, then as I mentioned, you can also bill for the urine drug screen. So you can do up to 26 a year and you can see that there's the code and uh, hopefully that, that that covers the cost of actually having to uh, buy them and um, uh, have nursing staff or whoever else is administering them in office. Okay, so this is going back to um, a study that Keith had shown in the first talk. This is, again, what's called the POTE study from 2011. And again, just to show when to taper buprenorphine naloxone. Well, as Keith had pointed out in this talk, that unfortunately, when people are on it for shorter uh, uh, durations of time, so uh, in the first phase, people were just on it for like a month and then returned to use following discontinuation. Or the second phase, people were on it for three months and then had a a one month washout period and it, after that return to use in about 95% of the time. So it's recommended that people be on it for longer periods because even after 12 weeks, generally it's not successful um, when people go off of it. So it's recommended that for people going on it, you can tell any of your patients who are, are interested. I mean, ideally, you know, ultimately it's their decision if they want to come off, but we would recommend ideally that they stay on it for a year or longer. Um, and when they do come off, that they would do it slowly, but you can let them know that because of the longer half-life, that the withdrawal tends to be less severe than for other opioids like heroin. But when, if and when they do taper, consider going slowly in increments of two milligrams every two to four weeks. So it may take weeks to even months in order for them to come down, just as you would um, ideally with methadone as well, to minimize the risk of uh, cravings, withdrawal, and a return to opioid use and potentially even overdose. Uh, you want to, so, you know, when you're tapering them, you want to reassess them at, at each interval for worsening withdrawal symptoms, cravings, or return to opioid use. And if so, consider stabilizing, so maintaining that dose for a period of time or increasing it, especially if they're using opioids. You want to increase the dose and encourage them to then stay on it for a longer period of time. Because if you continue to taper, most likely they're just going to continue um, using illicit opioids. Some other considerations, this is kind of uh, uh, some, some topics that people are often interested in. This is a bit beyond the scope of the guidelines, but uh, certainly I think of interest to most clinicians and so really just for um, some, uh, some food for thought. So some uh, adverse drug re reactions to be aware of, most commonly headache, nausea, or dry mouth, but uh, it tends to be pretty well tolerated in general. 
Um, there is a risk of respiratory or uh, neurological depression, but it's very rare. Um, but there is an increased risk when Suboxone is used in combination with alcohol or other sedative hypnotics. And you can see in this little graph here that when buprenorphine alone or benzos on their own, um, that it wasn't enough to cause a fatal th threshold, but in combination, that blue line, that potentially worsening the risk of overdose. And the same is true with alcohol. Uh, so some contraindications, most of these are fairly straightforward, but if people have uh, hepatic or respiratory disease, you want to be more cautious um, because of the potential for decreased respiratory drive uh, with any opioid. Um, and because it's metabolized by the liver, you want to be cautious in people with uh, liver disease. If they have an allergic or hypersensitivity reaction to either buprenorphine or naloxone component, obviously you would want to avoid that medication. And uh, technically, if they're pregnant or breastfeeding, that Health Canada uh, has a category C um, um, classification for the uh, buprenorphine. It's actually, sorry, the, it's the, the naloxone that that uh, is category C, which just means we don't know enough about it, whether or not it's um, potentially dangerous to the fetus. And um, as a result, the, the formulation of buprenorphine with naloxone, so the suboxone brand or, uh, formulation, that that is technically contraindicated in pres in uh, during pregnancy as per Health Canada. However, uh, there's nothing, there's been no studies that have ever shown that naloxone was dangerous. So uh, during pregnancy, so potentially you could, or if someone's already on suboxone, that um, that you could keep them on it, and um, but that would be an off-label use. Uh, you, technically or formally, you, you should be applying, if you're going to continue them on buprenorphine, apply for the buprenorphine-only formulation. It's called Subutex, and you can order that through Health Canada. So Health Canada has a website here, and you click on the Special Access Request form. And you can see here that's a two-page form that you fill out. Now, I've been told, I've actually never done this myself. One of my colleagues, Garrett Prinsloo, has done it, and has said that he found it fairly straightforward. But I've heard from other colleagues from around the province that they they have not had uh, a good experience doing this, and they essentially just said, don't bother doing it. So anyway, if needed, this is a, a nice race call. What should I do in this case? So give us a call, and we can give you some support around it. Uh, just keep in mind, however, that buprenorphine on its own um, has been provided to people, uh, to women during pregnancy, and that has actually been shown to have some benefits over methadone. And so this is a, a large study called the Mother Study, and they found that um, buprenorphine, um, um, sorry, mothers on buprenorphine had less neonatal abstinence syndrome compared to methadone. Furthermore, another more recent study found that um, pregnant women on buprenorphine, there was a lower risk of preterm birth, greater birth weight, and larger head circumference. So potentially, buprenorphine may be a better medication in pregnancy and most likely is going to be safe. Um, in Australia, they've essentially updated their guidelines to say that um, that it's there's likely no harm associated with the naloxone, so probably it's okay. But in, technically in Canada, um, as I mentioned, that that uh, the recommendation would, that you, would be that you use the buprenorphine only formulation. All right, so that's pregnancy. The, the other topic that um, people are often interested in asking about is pain. So if you remember back to the history slide at the beginning that buprenorphine was developed as an analgesic, um, but keep in mind that Health Canada, again, has only approved buprenorphine naloxone for the treatment of opioid use disorder. Uh, the off-label use of buprenorphine naloxone may be considered for patients with an opioid use disorder and pain responsive to opioids. Uh, typically, the analgesic period for buprenorphine is about six to eight hours, the same with methadone. So, uh, and just to reiterate the question that was asked earlier, uh, for pain, you, if you're splitting it and giving it three to four times a day, that may have better pain treatment um, than just providing it once a day. All right, here's a study from 2014 in pain medicine, and there's a really, really neat but small study where they took people on high dose of opioids and switched them onto buprenorphine, and they found that in general, people had uh, lower pain scores and improved quality of life. So if you've got you know, people challenging patients on high dose opioids in your practice um, and, you, and you're trying to, to switch them off, that um, potentially, you know, again, with support and that, you know, management and prevention, ideally, of that precipitated withdrawal, that um, uh, they could potentially be switched on to buprenorphine naloxone and have not only better pain, but higher quality of life. 
So uh, some potential for abuse and diversion. So uh, the previous reports of buprenorphine or subutex uh, formulation did have some reported uh, abuse for the euphoric effect, even though if you recall that when it's injected, that it has very little effect. But if they took it sublingually, potentially they could get a buprenorphine effect that for some people they find euphoric. It is an opioid after all. Um, uh, there have also been some reports of parenteral abuse by people who um, who are not tolerant, or sorry, not not physically dependent, meaning that they're not narcanning themselves. But what they do is if they inject it, they sort of let the naloxone component wear off after about 20 th or 30 minutes, and then they get the buprenorphine component that lasts longer. But again, if they're injecting it, the bioavailability of buprenorphine is less than 5%. Um, it also has street value and risk for diversion, and partly because as with methadone, um, people often want to treat their own withdrawal. So a lot of people who use opioids, they don't use every day and sometimes they don't want to use every day and they experience withdrawal symptoms and they would rather sometimes go and buy methadone or buy buprenorphine off uh, from a friend or a dealer rather than have to go to a pharmacy or get it from a, uh, a prescriber. So keep that in mind, especially with carries that, that uh, you may be contributing to this market if, um, uh, if people aren't uh, if people are not taking their carries as prescribed. So that's why we do the urine drug screen and you do the sometimes the random pill counts and things like that. Um, so in summary, hopefully um, after this presentation, you feel that opioid use disorders um, or you recognize that they have an increasing risk of overdose and death, but um, that you recognize um, and appreciate that they are treatable conditions so that there are lots of people with very severe opioid use disorders and people with less severe, but um, that they certainly can be treated. And as Keith mentioned, that uh, ideally we're, we're hoping to help shift this into um, a primary care setting for a lot of the substance use treatment that's being provided around the province. Um, and opioid uh, just going back to the guidelines that opioid agonist therapies, i.e. medications like methadone and buprenorphine and naloxone, are the gold standard for treatment of opioid use disorders. That's not to take away from the value that psych psychosocial treatment programs, um, whether inpatient or outpatient, that that, um, that can have. And those can be life-changing life experiences and, uh, and treatment options for people. But the evidence is very strong that, unfortunately, for some people, attending one of those can increase the risk of overdose and that some people just do not find them effective or um, are not able to achieve an abstinence. So that's where medications are really, the, as, as you can uh, hopefully appreciate from the guidelines, that really they're recommended for anyone with a, a more severe uh, opioid use disorder. And uh, that buprenorphine naloxone represents a newer alternative to methadone with greater access now in BC and a lower risk profile. Um, and as I mentioned, family physicians can treat opioid use disorder in office, including starting someone or continuing someone on buprenorphine naloxone, that office-based inductions are possible. And even if you're not routinely doing them because of the time and uh, energy that they can require, that hopefully you felt like if you had to do it in theory, you now feel confident um, on knowing how to do that properly. Okay, so a careful approach to avoid precipitated withdrawal, and after that, it's smooth sailing. And remember that you may have local resources that could be available for helping support you to, to help your patients start on buprenorphine naloxone, and they can then be referred back, and uh, you can continue them on. So that's the end of that presentation, and, and just one last plug for the race line. We're happy to have calls from anywhere uh, in the province, and uh, you know, love hearing from people, and happy to give support anytime for any reason with respect to a substance use disorder. All right, great. So uh, we'll now take some questions and uh, and go from there. So we had an earlier question, and this is from Willem, who said, if pa if a patient is on Suboxone and end up in the ER, what to use for acute pain? Example, pancreatitis. Great question. So sorry, someone comes in on buprenorphine naloxone. Um, so you know that um, it's going to be a challenge because other other ag uh, opioids may not bind to it as effectively, and they've got an acute painful condition like like uh, acute pancreatitis. So it's a challenge. Um, there's a couple things you could do. Remember that suboxone or uh, buprenorphine is an analgesic. So you could give doses, let's say they've had 16 that morning, you could give them two to four milligrams sublingual Q4H PRN for breakthrough pain. And that, that can be an effective way for lots of people that, that we see in hospital. That's an effective way of treating their pain. 
If they say, you know what, like I, I really like the buprenorphine naloxone, it's helpful for my cravings and my withdrawal, but you know, it doesn't really help for pain. Even when I've tried splitting it or even right after I've taken it, it doesn't really do anything for my pain. You know, and they're telling you that and, and you you feel that they look like they're uncomfortable or they're in withdrawal, that rather than persisting with something that, that doesn't seem to be working, um, you could overwhelm the um, the buprenorphine on the receptor in a number of ways. One, recall that hydromorphone has a fairly high binding affinity as well that's almost as high as buprenorphine. So potentially hydromorphone could be uh, a nice um, analgesic you can add to help uh, to uh, treat their pain better. You could also add something like fentanyl or sufentanyl, especially if it was, let's say, acutely painful or they were going to have a procedure. Um, or a fentanyl patch even, if you felt like that that, uh, that was safe to administer on someone, they weren't going to leave and then inject it or something. But with the right candidate, um, a fentanyl patch could be effective. Another question, how does UDI differentiate between buprenorphine and other opiates? How does a urine drug screen um, differentiate between buprenorphine and other, and other opiates? So that's a, a good question. And so again, depending on different, um, different types of assays. So the typical one would test for methadone metabolite and morphine as well. Uh, so often those would be positive if those substances were present, but you can add specific things like you can add oxycodone, you can add buprenorphine. So specific um, uh, immunoassay tests that would only be positive if that opioid was present. Uh, keep in mind that synthetic opioids, so like fentanyl or uh, methadone, that they won't test positive for opioids, um, so that you have to do a special test for it. Um, but other natural opioids or semi-synthetic ones, so like hydromorphone, morphine, codeine, that those should test positive for opioids. If you're ever uncertain on how to interpret the results, feel free to call your lab and you can get some support in doing that. Or if if it doesn't add up and you're and you're not sure what to make of it clinically, send it for confirmatory testing. We have another great question in the channel here. So how does a family physician who has not been prescribing Suboxone start prescribing any stipulated pathway? Great question. Um, so up until July of 2016, in British Columbia, you had to have a methadone license in order to prescribe buprenorphine naloxone. And uh, even then, if you did have a methadone license, you had to take a course, or it was recommended that you take a course done on like an honor system uh, that was called suboxonecme.com. So as it says in the name, or as you can appreciate, this is something developed by the pharmaceutical company that makes the, the brand name Suboxone. And, um, you know, a reasonable course, but obviously, you know, developed by a pharmaceutical company. So not ideal in terms of uh, risk of bias. And uh, fortunately, in July of 2016, in British Columbia, like in, um, to, to sort of follow suit with most other provinces in Canada, buprenorphine naloxone was uncoupled from methadone, which means that now any, any physician in British Columbia can prescribe buprenorphine naloxone. Um, up until now, in order to do that, again, it's the same honor system. So it's recommended that you take this online course through the pharmaceutical uh, website that they made. But as of July of 2017, the BC Center on Substance Use will launch its own online content that will have a program so you, you can go online and uh, and do content and get CME um, and learn properly how to do this. So hopefully you'll feel like in addition to these, these uh, webinars today, which are just kind of an introduction, that you'll be able to go through at your own pace and in a way that is helpful for you and uh, feel, feel confident by the end of that in, in being able to do this. Thanks for that question. That may have been a plug from Christy. I don't know if Christy's in the audience, but we appreciate it. Okay. Great. Okay. So I just want to go back to the first question, was, which is around acute pain. So I mentioned different uh, opioids that you can prescribe. I also just want to say that you may need to prescribe higher doses. So let's say you give someone a milligram or two milligrams of hydromorphone and they're on buprenorphine naloxone and, and they tell you it's not touching them and they still look uncomfortable and they're not sedated. You may have to go to higher doses. And that's true in general of people with substance use disorders and opioid use disorders uh, in particular, that there's um, a good body of literature that shows that they tend to have actually higher pain needs. So so, um, patients and providers, there's often stigma uh, and, and fear from patients that they're not going to be 
um, given opioids if they get in pain, you know, especially if they're on Suboxone and they're worried that if they have a painful condition like pancreatitis, that they're um, not going to be given something or not given enough. So just to be aware of that, they may need to give them higher doses. Another aside, and just I can't help it, but if someone had pancreatitis, I'd be worried about alcohol. So please inquire about that because the combination of alcohol and buprenorphine, naloxone or methadone or any other opioids for that matter, increases their risk of um, unintentional overdose, as does concurrent prescribing of benzodiazepines. There's another question I think that we skipped earlier. Okay, so I'll just read it out and then I'll, I'll do my best to answer it. So this is an eMERGE physician with the Society of General Practitioners. Worth reminding people that if they are full service family physicians and have submitted the 14070, the attachment fee, that they can bill the 14043 mental health planning fee to make diagnosis of an opioid use disorder and create a plan of care for treatment. For example, starting someone on buprenorphine naloxone. Uh, this is a minimum 30 minute visit and there's a one-time fee of $100. Uh, and then that allows billing a four more 0120 equivalent fees. So thank you very much for adding that. And I have to say, I don't do a lot of um, primary care outside of our hospital. So I'm not as familiar with the, uh, the billing codes. I'm also, I trained in Ontario, so I'm not as familiar with BC billing codes in general. So I really appreciate that comment and hopefully that for other providers, um, uh, that that's helpful to review and if you have any concerns i would contact um contact you know the province or um you know the, the msp about the appropriate way the best way to billing but that's really helpful and i'm glad that msp recognizes that it is labor intensive and and are appropriately um, um paying paying physicians to do those complex assessments and really to be providing uh, time and uh, uh, resources in order to make it um, feasible and um, to be compensated for doing that kind of work because it's really, really important. The, again, you know, to, to start someone on a plan and assess them, that could be a life-changing um, intervention for them. And we appreciate all, everyone who's joined tonight and everyone who ha obviously has an interest in treating substance use disorders and, uh, and learning more about how to treat opioid use disorders and buprenorphine naloxone in general. Any last minute questions? So I think that's it for questions. And so we'll, we'll end there. But uh, again, if you have any follow-up questions, please let Amanda know and I'm happy to forward that. Uh, she'd be happy to forward that to uh, to Keith or myself or Christy Sutherland. And um, really, we're happy to have phone calls from you through the race line, or you can always call St. Paul's Hospital and just ask for the addiction on call, whatever way you want. We're happy to speak with uh, any physician around the province anytime uh, and give you as much support as we can. So thank you all for attending.